Hello there and welcome. My name is Peter. For those joining for the first time, I am a young earth creationist and I'm very interested in paleoanthropology, which is the study of fossil humans and some other similar creatures. And so today, this is my first time live streaming, so that's really fun. I'm not the most techie person around, and so you'll probably have to bear with me a little bit kind of as we go through this. But my goal today is to talk about a very special skeleton called Littlefoot. Littlefoot is the most complete Australopithecus skeleton ever found. And so today I want to kind of take a little bit of a deep dive, kind of looking at that in detail. Thanks so much uh, for those kind of joining right now. We don't have a whole lot of people, um, but we will probably get things kicked off here. As I mentioned before, uh, let me know if you have any problems with the audio in the chat. Um, but yeah, without any further ado, let's get on to kind of the subject today. Today we're going to be talking about Australopithecines. This is an example of Australopithecus africanus. This is actually the very first Australopithecus fossil ever found. It was found by Raymond Dart in 1924. And it is called uh, the Tong Child because it came from a site in uh, South Africa called Tong. Uh, it was at this mining town that they were mining for lime and they found this beautifully preserved, you know, skull and uh, as well as the mandible and kind of this imprint of the brain back here, which is really cool. But Raymond's Dart's discovery of this individual really kind of revolutionized the whole world of paleoanthropology because up until that point, people kind of thought uh, about two main groups. There were um, basically the extent apes like chimpanzees and gorillas. And then there were things that looked pretty human. This changed things up quite a bit because it has kind of a mixture of traits. It is a mosaic form. It has traits of both the extent apes like chimpanzees and gorillas and those seen, you know, in modern humans. And Raymond Dart was working based off of this skull to argue that this was a bipedal species. Uh, that is a species that walks upright on its hind legs. And he had a very difficult time and he faced a lot of criticism uh, for his claims about this. And that was because he was working with a juvenile skull like this. And so he was arguing, you know, that this was a, a creature that was quite a bit uh, more human-like than the extent apes. And the problem is that apes tend to kind of vary as they grow in terms of exactly what their face looked like. And one part of that is kind of the prognathism of the face, which he saw was, uh, you know, not very much in this individual. It doesn't stick out very much. But because this is a juvenile, he couldn't really be sure what this would look like when it grew up. And so a lot of people basically told Raymond Dart that what he was looking at was just a baby chimpanzee or a baby gorilla. And now, um, you know, 100, uh, 120 years later, we have a lot more evidence about this group here. And so today I want to focus on the most complete Australopithecus that we've ever found. Now, before we get into things, I kind of want to talk generally about the Australopithecines as a group. There are a lot of different species within the genus Australopithecus. For example, there's Australopithecus afarensis. That's the species to which the famous Lucy fossil belongs. There's also Australopithecus africanus. Here's an example of that. Uh, this is called STS-5. It's a very famous skull of this species, and it is one of uh, the most complete. And then there's also a species called Australopithecus anamensis. Um, Australopithecus sediba, and others. Now, there's been a lot of debate about whether the Australopithecines were bipeds or not. As I kind of mentioned, there was kind of this whole early controversy, and later on, there was a big controversy between two main sides. 
Um, one side was called the Stony Brook kind of thought, uh, school of thought, as I remember it. And basically, they were arguing that the Australopithecines weren't bipedal. Other people were arguing that they were. And there was a whole debate about this until eventually kind of the Stony Brook school of thought eventually kind of died away. And the main um, view that Australopithecines were bipedal basically dominated the field. Now, we come to an issue here, and that is with creationism. Young Earth creationism has always kind of tended to view the Australopithecines as either not being real, that is, they're a mixture of human and ape bones, uh, as they like to put it, um, or they like to say that the Australopithecines were quadrupedal, that is, they walk on all four of their legs. And the, Austral the bones that we know of cause some issues for that. And so specifically, what people claim is that Australopithecus sediba is a fake species. They say that that's a mixture of human and ape bones. Um, they would say the same for Australopithecus afarensis, so that's Lucy's species. And then they would also say the same for, in some cases for Australopithecus africanus, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And that, I think, is a, is a bad critique. It's a bit of a rescue device, you know, just to say that everything that you don't immediately kind of understand just must be kind of fictional, made up, fake, hoax, you know, whatever. And I think that those kind of views are discredited by this particular find. So I'm going to share my screen here and kind of go ahead. And I have a bit of a PowerPoint to share with you today. So let me get that up on screen here. All right, here, so we've got our PowerPoint, and there we go. So you should now be able to see my PowerPoint, and it looks like that is all working wonderful. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, yep, about this guy right here. This is the one we've been talking about up until now. It's a beautiful skeleton, as you can see. We have basically every single part of the body represented for this individual. And he's nicknamed Littlefoot, and you'll hear why in just a minute. But the technical name that he's referred to uh, by, or I should say she, actually, this is actually a female skeleton, is STW573. ST stands for Sturkfontein. Um, and 573 is the catalog number. All right, so let's kind of look at the discovery of this individual. This is the man who played a very crucial role in his discovery. His name is Ronald Clark. Uh, he's Dr. Clark. He's a professional paleoanthropologist, uh, very involved in the field. And as I mentioned here in the slide, he's associated with the University of the Witzbottersrand. That's in South Africa. They store a lot of kind of the most important fossil finds in recent history. And they have a huge collection from like the famous site of Sturkfontein in South Africa. And then he's also involved in Johann Wolfgang Goethe University, which is in Germany. Now, the discovery of Littlefoot happened in a very interesting way. In 1980, basically, they had collected some bones from this cave, uh, Sturkfontein Cave, in this region called the Silberberg Grotto. And they found a ton of different bones, and among them were some bones of Cercopithecids. Now, a Cercopithecid is basically an old world monkey. And they collected these bones of the foot here, which they believed belonged to uh, an old world monkey, and so they put them in this box and um, labeled it Circopithecids. Now, in 1994, Dr. Clark was looking through the collection that they had gotten from Sturkfontein and just taking a look at the bones that they had from that site. And he found some of these bones here. I believe he found, let's see, it was uh, the talus here, the navicular, 
uh, the medial cuneiform and then part of the first uh, metatarsal here. Those are the four, I believe, that he found. And based off of that, he realized that he was not looking at um, an old world monkey bone. He was looking at a hominin bone that had been mistakenly identified, misclassified as belonging to an old world monkey. And he realized that, yeah, a monkey does not have a foot like this. And we'll kind of discuss this particular foot in more detail in a little while here. Going on to our next slide here. This is also what he found. He found this part of the tibia right here. So the tibia is the bone in your lower leg. Um, it is kind of just, you know, a, a long bone. It makes up basically your shin and Ronald Clark had found a small portion of the tibia. You can see the crack here. He found this portion down here in that box, and it was mistakenly labeled as belonging to a cercopithecate. Excuse me while I get that out of the way. Okay, so he had found this tibial fragment, and basically he realized that that was probably a pretty important bone there, and so he sent two men into the cave where this had been discovered with this portion of the tibia here to see if they could try and find where that tibia had come from. Um, we've got somebody in the chat here. Hey, Chris Peacock, thanks for joining on. Uh, great to have you here. So this is a picture of the Silberberg Grotto and two men, uh, who Ronald Clark sent there were Stefan Matsumi and Nakwani Molefi. Now, they had this shaft of this tibia, and what Dr. Clark told them to do was to go find a place in the cave wall where a bone was sticking out and to see if this end of this tibia would fit onto it, which is pretty challenging work, right? To go through a cave, just look for some random bone that's sticking out of the wall, and then see if yours fits onto it. What's amazing is that they were even using like lanterns to do this. So like absolutely, you know, just crazy. Um, but they did this. And within two days, they literally found a bone uh, right up here. They found this portion of the bone. They didn't see the whole thing like this. They just saw this little part at the end sticking out. And they realized that this fit onto this pretty well. So they got Dr. Clark and... Um, excavations started there and they started uncovering this and what they realized is that not only was there the other half of this bone there was quite a bit more of a hominin skeleton in the rock here in this particular picture look right at here and this is kind of the concentration of the bones right there um but after that kind of initial discovery things kicked off quite a bit because the excavation took a very, very long time. It lasted 20 years. Uh, Robin Crompton here, he said, before the cave infill became solidified, the bones thus became decalcified and extremely fragile. So yeah, in this case, the bones were actually softer than the rock, which they were removing the bones from. So it was a very, very difficult um, excavation job. That's why it took 20 years. And then once they had actually excavated the whole skeleton and could bring it into the lab, right, then they actually have to, you know, clean each of the individual bones, kind of write descriptions of them. So all of this work has been a very, very long time in coming. And there's a lot about Littlefoot that we don't know yet that has not even been published yet. For example, the hand. They found a beautiful hand fossil. And kind of as far as we know yet, they are still working on extracting the, the hand from the matrix. And so, um, yeah, so there's a lot to look forward yet to Littlefoot. Uh, we have uh, a description of the hand that we're waiting for. We're waiting for a description of the foot. We are hoping in the future for kind of a more complete description of the vertebrae. Um, the pelvis and the sacrum haven't really been described in detail yet. So there is a wealth of information here. And we have just barely skimmed the surface of what we can learn from this amazing skeleton. 
Now, Littlefoot is a very complete skeleton, as I mentioned before. And from the estimates that I looked up, it's about 90% complete. You have basically every major part. You have parts of the foot, you have full leg bones, you have basically the full pelvis and sacrum, uh, quite a bit of the vertebral column. There are some elements missing, lots of the ribs. You have basically complete arms, and then you have a complete left hand, it appears, and the skull is, is basically complete as well. So basically, there's nothing like this that has ever been discovered before. There are skeletons of Australopithecine, such as Lucy, but those are quite a bit less complete than this. And so really, this allows us to do a lot of interesting things involved with kind of like learning about limb proportions. Because when we're looking at bones and trying to figure out the limb proportions of species, what we need is bones all from the same individual, right? Because if we have like the bones of somebody who's small and we're comparing them to somebody who's big, that doesn't really work because, you know, it's just going to break down our limb proportions. So when we're studying limb proportions of creatures, we need to have them all from one single individual. And this is an amazing example because like even Lucy, right? Her femur, let's see, I have right here. Lucy's femur has a break in it. It's represented here by kind of this black stuff here that they've, you know, reconstructed that part with. And so we don't exactly know how long Lucy's femur was. And it's the same thing with her humerus. Her humerus is also broken kind of in, in, in some pieces. And the same with the radius, the ulna, and the tibia. So although we have all of those parts represented for Lucy, we don't really know exactly how long her long bones were. And that's an issue because, as you'll see in a minute, they are very, very important to interpreting how a creature moves. So this allows us, for the first time, to really have a good idea of the limb proportions of an Australopithecine without a lot of reconstruction and without a lot of doubt. And now let's kind of uh, show you the site here. This is a 3D model of the site where Littlefoot was found. And you can see here, we've got kind of the bones represented in white on this kind of dark tan surface. So they actually took like 3D scanners into the cave to get this here. And what you'll notice here is the skull. Um, the humerus is attached to the side of the skull here. And then up here is a very interesting part. I have it in a photograph on the next slide. Look at that. This is actually the lower arm and bones of the hand. Isn't that beautiful? What we actually have right there is an articulated bone. So articulation, right, is when we have the bones fit together in the way that they are uh, like when an animal is living. And you can see here we've got the ulna and the radius and they're right next to each other. And then on the end of that, we have the hand and the hand is clenched up like this. And so we have this, you know, just beautifully preserved lower arm and hand perfectly preserved, you know, just like they were while this creature was living. Now, one thing that you might be wondering is, is this a single individual? And I think there's a lot of good reasons to believe that it is a single individual. Um, let's go back up here. You can see here how all of the bones were found in pretty close association, right? We have the the lower arm and hand here, we have the skull right underneath that kind of, and then the humerus that belongs there. Uh, we have a bit of the backbone, I believe, here, and then some parts of the femur and stuff over here. So there's a lot of the parts all very close together. Um, that's one argument. There's also no duplication. So if we are thinking that, you know, there's multiple individuals here, we would think, you know, we would find multiple bones that are kind of duplicated, right? So rather than finding one left humerus and one right humerus, isn't that funny, humerus? Um, oh my, we've devolved into bone puns already. Um, you would expect, you know, to find like multiple left humerus uh, fragments or, you know, multiple femora, but that's not what we find. We find, in fact, you know, multiple, or sorry, we do not find duplication. We only find bones enough for one individual. 
And then we also have the articulation, as I showed in this slide. So when we have a hand on the end of an arm, you know, we can be pretty sure that the hand and the arm went together. Uh, so that's kind of proof that this, at least what we're seeing here, is one individual. And then we have proportional similarity. And that is that like none of the bones are like extraordinarily large or like don't seem to fit with the others or extraordinarily small. They all seem kind of like around the same kind of general uh, relative size that we would expect if we're looking at a single individual. And then finally, we have here maturational homogeneity. And that is that basically all the bones seem to be of the same age. Um, for example, your bones have these growth plates called epiphyseals. Um, basically, what happens is that you are born with a lot more bones than you have when you are older, and your bones fuse together, especially kind of on the end. So like the end of your humerus, there's a joint between the shaft, not a joint, but a, a growth fusion area between the shaft and the head of the humerus. And as you age, that'll solidify. And so basically that there's the same thing for a lot of different bones, not just for the humerus. Um, and we see that in all of the bones that we look at, Littlefoot has, you know, fully formed bones. The fusion of the bones has happened. And like the same with the sacrum, there aren't like gaps between the vertebrae. The vertebrae have in fact, you know, fused together, indicating that this is an adult. And we don't find like, uh, you know, unfused bones of juveniles. No, all the bones show the same level of fusion. And thus, we think that they all come from a single individual of, you know, a, uh, I believe it's kind of an mid to early kind of aged female adult. So now I want to take a little bit of a look at some of the papers that have come out about Littlefoot. Beginning here with this paper called The Long Limb Bones of the STW 573 Australopithecus Skeleton from Sturfentein Member 2, Descriptions and Proportions. Sorry there. So what you'll see here are a couple interesting graphs. Um, these are pretty cool graphs because they show here, um, this one is neck length, so we're looking at the femur. Let me grab my femur here. This is the femur, and what they're looking at is this part here. We have the ball of the femur, and then we have the trochanter. There's a greater, and there's a lesser trochanter on your femur. And basically, they're saying that they're measuring the neck length and then dividing it by the dimensions right underneath the trochanter. And what they find is that um, little foot, as you can see there, falls, you know, fairly high uh, along with other australopithecines and, you know, some early humans here. And they're kind of still within the range of modern creatures. Um, but, you know, they're on the fairly high end. So that's kind of interesting that all these early hominins seem to be on the kind of the high end of this particular dimension. Going over here, we have radial length divided by femoral length. And this is kind of interesting. You can see over here, gorillas and chimpanzees form a very nice kind of line here. Humans uh, form a nice kind of linear correlation be over here. And then you can see Australopithecines, Lucy is here, and then uh, Littlefoot is here, kind of right in the middle. So that's pretty cool uh, that you can kind of see these three groups here. And uh, a and kind of interesting side note, you see this group out here that is gorillas uh, that kind of falls way far out. Those are actually male gorillas. I've done like similar graphs to this one myself. And it turns out that male gorillas show like such sexual dimorphism that they fall like way far away from females. And you kind of get a little bit of a gap here. Down here are probably females and up here are probably males. But that's interesting bit of trivia, trivia there. Now, what I found especially interesting about this paper and what I think is probably kind of the biggest uh, value that we get from it is the, the limb proportions. This here is the graph that they provide in the paper. Over here, we have uh, several different taxa. Right here, we have pan, so that is chimpanzees, uh, probably just a common chimpanzee. And what you'll notice here is um, they have basically the proportional lengths of each of these bones. So uh, next we have Kosan. That is a group of modern humans who are very kind of divergent from 
modern humans in general. They're kind of the most unique group of modern humans. And then we have uh, basically kind of your more typical modern human. What you'll notice here is that chimpanzees have kind of a, a bit of a shorter humerus, but they have very long ulna and radius. That's the bones in your forearm. And then they have a super short femur and a very short tibia as well. When you look at modern humans, we have a little bit of a longer, you know, humerus, but we have a shorter radius and ulna, and we have a much, much, much longer femur and tibia. Now, when you look at fossils, notice this. STW-573, so that's the little foot, the one that we're talking about, it has basically a, a, uh, uh, a humerus that is very similar in size, you know, length to that of a chimpanzee. Um, the only ulna and radius is a lot shorter than in a chimpanzee. The femur is longer and the tibia is longer. So that's kind of interesting. It's very similar to actually what we're seeing in modern humans, right? Those limb proportions uh, of the longer leg, the shorter arm are something that are seen in modern humans because modern humans walk upright. And so we have different limb proportions than chimpanzees. Here's kind of another representation of this. This is really cool. Um, what you'll see here is, uh, the, once again, we have the humerus, the radius, the femur, and then the tibia. And what they put here is a nice little demarcating line. That's this dashed line going right through the center of the graph here. And this is where you've got, uh, that line is basically 50-50, um, dividing things right in half. And what you'll notice is that gorillas and chimpanzees both have longer arms than they have legs. So their arms actually go down past the midpoint of the graph here, and their legs, you know, don't go all the way up to that. And then you look at Lucy. This is kind of a bit of an estimate, so, you know, I'm not sure how much faith I, I put in it. It's, it's probably pretty close. Um, but what you see here is that Lucy appears to have had longer legs and arms. And the same with Littlefoot, right? So we have really no you know, problems of little foot. It's, it's so complete. And what we see in it is that they have longer legs than arms. And then the same thing with KNM WT 15,000, which is a uh, Neriocotomy skeleton. It's, it's from uh, the Turkana. It's, it's from near Lake Turkana in Kenya. And then modern humans, as you can see, also have, you know, longer legs than arms. So this is very interesting that we have kind of two groups here. We have those who have shorter legs than arms and those who have longer legs than arms. And what I find interesting is that Littlefoot, you know, falls on the side that humans are on. Now, this becomes an especially difficult challenge for those who want to claim that Littlefoot is a quadruped. Let me go on to the next graph here before I kind of get into that. Here we can see kind of um, each of the bones of the individual are to scale, uh, but not to one another. But what you'll see is that in Littlefoot and in modern humans, we have a very long femur and tibia compared to our humerus. And then in Simangs, orangutans, chimpanzees, and gorillas, all, in all of those, we have a longer humerus. Now you might be wondering, Okay, but why is there this division here? Like, why do some creatures have longer forelimb bones and some have longer hind limb bones? Well, it all has to do with how you walk. And here is a picture um, of that, kind of illustrating that. Now, if you've ever walked around on your hands and your knees, why did you walk around on your hands and your knees? Why didn't you walk around on your hands and your feet? Well, the reason is because if you walk around on your hands, hands and your feet, as is kind of depicted here, and in this case, the legs are even flexed, um, your rear, this portion of you right here, sticks way, way, way up in the air, and it's hard to see where you are going. You cannot look around very easily with your rear way up in the air. And that is because our legs are so long, they put the back of our body way up tall, and our arms are short, so kind of our body slants forward. And that is an issue when we try to walk around on four legs. Now, that's why kids usually walk around on their hands and their knees, right? Because then you are looking upwards more than kind of looking downwards. And that is actually what chimpanzees have, except they don't need to walk around on their knees because their legs are so short. 
And so in this example here, what you see there is that the chimpanzee has very short legs compared to its arms. And so it has this kind of tilt of its body where its head is up and its rear is angled downwards. And that makes it so it can look where it is going, unlike a modern human. Now, this all ties into the position of the foramen magnum. And let me stop sharing for a minute here so I can kind of talk a little bit about that. This is a modern human skull. Um, his name is Bob. If you look right here, there is what is called the foramen magnum or the big hole. That's just Latin for big hole. Foramen means hole and magnum means big or large. And basically, this is the biggest hole in the skull. And it's because that's where your spinal column goes in and connects to your vertebrae and basically travels through your backbone all the way down, giving nerves out to all the ends of your body. Now, creatures have different positions of the frame and magnum. So chimpanzees have a frame and magnum that's positioned further down and back on the skull. Humans have one right in the middle on the bottom because we walk around like this, right? So we have, imagine my hand is the backbone. We have a backbone that is vertical and then right on top of it, you want your skull to sit. Chimpanzees have one that's more back here because they have a backbone that extends like this. And so, you know, they want to look where they're going like that. So basically we can tell how a creature's head is positioned on their backbone by looking at the shape kind of, and the angle, and basically where this hole is situated on a skull. Now, in the case of Littlefoot and other australopithecines, we have a very human-like placement of that. Here is STS-5 again, um, Mrs. Plez, it's referred to, and you can see the hole right there, and it's placed basically in the center, in the middle, like you would expect from a creature, you know, that has a head right on top of its vertebral column. Now, there's a number of different types of creatures that can have a head placed like that. Um, chimpanzees, as I mentioned, have a kind of a, a frame and magnum that's placed more towards the back. And that's because they are quadrupeds and they're knuckle walkers. So they walk around on their knuckles. And as you could see from that picture, which I will share again, they um, basically need their head oriented like that so they can see where they're going as they walk around. Now, if a human tries to walk like that, we have to bend our neck like way around like this to see where we are going because um, our head goes on the end of our spinal column. And if we are situated with our spinal column horizontally, we end up looking straight at the ground, which happens not to be particularly useful for walking around. Now, what does that all have to do with Littlefoot? The point is, um, talking about all of that, that Littlefoot has that frame and magnum in the bottom and the middle. And so it would make sense that his, or sorry, her spinal column you know, went straight up into her skull. And then in addition, the limb proportions would tell us that Littlefoot was standing upright because creatures that are quadrupeds or even, you know, arboreal don't have limb proportions like that. And in addition, if we try to put Littlefoot on the ground and make him into a quadruped, look at that. It doesn't really work because he has that frame and magnum there and he'd just be looking straight at the ground. And in addition, you can see his whole body would be angled down just like ours when we try to walk on our hands and legs. And he'd be looking not only straight at the ground, but his rear would be way up in the air. And it's a very inefficient and bad way of moving around. So that is how we know that Littlefoot was a biped because it, it simply doesn't make sense. As I say here, it's just not functionally compatible with quadrupedalism. You don't have proportions, limb proportions like this, and walk around on four legs because it just does not work. It, it doesn't make sense. It's less energy efficient. And basically, you're more vulnerable to predators and stuff like that. So all of that goes to show that Littlefoot was a biped. The limb proportions clearly show that Littlefoot was walking around like us more than he was like chimpanzees. And so... 
ultimately, I think just looking at these limb proportions alone kind of solves this whole controversy about whether or not the Australopithecines were bipeds. Now that we have these complete limb bones, we can definitively say that the Australopithecines were bipeds and not quadrupeds because their anatomy simply does not work in the form of a quadruped. Now, um, that is something which makes the little foot appear very human-like, but there's also a lot of features of little foot which kind of tend to show that this creature was at least somewhat arboreal. So let's look at some of those. This um, kind of comes from this paper here, the pictorial girdle of STW573, little foot. And we have here, I've put together a comparative picture. I recently had the opportunity to go on a research trip and take some of these photos here. This is a gorilla scapula. These are all in scale here, these three. Um, you look how massive that is compared to a human. And then you have the chimpanzee and the modern human. One thing that you'll notice is that like proportionally, the gorilla and the chimpanzee have very tall, a very tall scapula. And that is something that we also see in Littlefoot here. We see a very tall scapula, and it's not super wide. Now, there's a bit of distortion, and it's cracked a little bit, but there does see, seem to be something to that, um, meaning that Littlefoot probably was using his scapula in ways, you know, similar to chimpanzees. And, you know, just the general kind of form isn't the only proof of that. There's a lot of metrics in this paper. Here we go. This is figure 13 of that paper, and they show four kind of plots where they're looking at some angles. Uh, here is ventral bar glenoid angle. So that's basically, let's see, let me grab my scapula here. It's nice to have a whole human skeleton sitting right here, and I can just kind of grab whatever I need and talk about it. Okay, so here we go. I've got a scapula. And basically, what they're measuring here is this portion here called the axillary border of your scapula. And then they're measuring kind of the angle between that and then this. This is called uh, the, the glenoid fossa. And it's basically where your humerus joins into your scapula. Now, this whole bone goes right back here in your body, kind of on the back side here, um, like that. And basically, your arm articulates right into this fossa right here. This is the articular surface. So there's a lot of things about this here that, that show that it was, you know, that this, uh, that STW573 Littlefoot, you know, was using his scapula in a way like chimpanzees and other arboreal creatures do. So look at this, check this out. We have here several different ranges. Let me see if I can zoom in on this particular graph and if you will be able to see that. Yes, it looks like you can see me zoom in. Good. What you'll see here is that Homo, uh, I think this is Homo sapiens here, falls pretty high up on this graph. Um, so basically what that means is that there's quite a bit of an angle between this border and then kind of the plane of the fossa. Check out some other things. Here's MH2, that's Australopithecus sediva, falls very low. Uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, all fall really low. And what that means is that this fossa is kind of more in line with the whole axillary border of the scapula. The reason is, is because basically their scapula is oriented differently than ours. SCW573, Littlefoot, as we're talking about here, has a very low scapular kind of angle, this ventral bar glenoid angle as well. And basically that means that he had his scapula oriented in such a way that his arm was more mobile than ours. And it could kind of have more of kind of a range of motion. Here's another graph showing kind of the axillary border along this side, but this time against this spine here. Um, once again, you can kind of see STW573 falls kind of along with chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and a lot of other things as being very low angle again. Um, over here, we've got more of kind of the angle of the scapula from the bottom. And what you'll notice here, uh, STW573 kind of falls in the range of chimpanzees, gorillas, and uh, pongo. 
Uh, this one isn't quite as nicely stratified as the others because it does kind of fall in some of the range of modern humans as well. And here's another kind of similar graph. Uh, let's move on to the next graph. Okay, so this is one where we're looking at uh, ratios and, you know, distances. Um, once again, what you'll see generally is that on a lot of these measurements, STW573 correlates pretty strongly with gorillas and chimpanzees. And once again, that's telling us that their scapula is, is angled in a way that's quite a bit different than ours. They're using it. Um, probably for climbing, so they have kind of this greater range of motion with their arm, and basically their arm is kind of more free to move around than ours is, which is, you know, very useful when you are climbing around. Now, um, we are already, let's see here, uh, quite a few minutes into here, so thank you for everyone who's still watching. Uh, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat, and I will try to answer them live. Um, I have a little bit of participation going on here with all of you in the audience. Um, and next, let's look at this. This is that arm that I was showing you before. Now, there's uh, some features of the hand which make it interesting. This is kind of a comparative photo of a human hand and then a chimpanzee hand. And one thing that you'll notice, which makes kind of humans different, uh, there's a lot of things if you're looking at individual bones, but I'm talking more of proportions here, you can see that humans have relatively long thumbs. And that has something to do with, you know, how we manipulate objects with our hands. And basically having that longer thumb allows us to be kind of more versatile. We can actually touch the tips of all our fingers using our thumb. Chimpanzees have a very tiny little dinky thumb compared to their fingers, which are like super, super long. They have super long fingers because they're constantly, you know, using them in the trees. And thus, you know, it's, it's beneficial to an organism to have long fingers that it can grasp all the way around a branch and use, you know, to swing from it. It's also useful for knuckle walking, where you kind of have these long extensions on the bottom of your hand, you know, that you can use to kind of uh, stand on. So generally, this is, you know, a difference that separates humans and chimpanzees. And what you'll notice here you can't really see it very well in this photograph, but it appears that STW573, Littlefoot, has a thumb which is more similar in proportion to a human. And that's not really like that surprising because we would have expected that from Australopithecus afarensis. Australopithecus afarensis, um, coming from the AL333 site in Ethiopia, they have found, you know, a, a hand skeleton. They've made it composite a composite reconstruction from a number of different individuals. And what they found was, yeah, that it seemed that the thumb proportions were probably going to be, you know, uh, pretty, pretty long compared to the fingers, more like modern humans than chimpanzees. Another difference that we see uh, separating the chimpanzee and human groups is the foot. This is a comparative view of the feet of several different hominins actually hominids, I should say. This over here on the far right is a modern human foot. And one thing which sets it apart is this big toe here that sticks straight forward. Now, basically, our toes are all in line with one another. There's a little bit of a larger gap between your big toe and your other toes. But basically, yeah, they're all kind of positioned forwards. Now, in Littlefoot, we see a very similar thing. This is the first metatarsal right here. And you can see there's not a huge gap in between the first and second metatarsals, indicating that Littlefoot probably didn't have much of a divergent big toe. On the other hand, when you look at a chimpanzee, you see a prime example of having, you know, that, that big toe that sticks out to the side here. So much so, you know, that this almost looks like a hand. You can see here, you know, on your hand, your hand is a little different from your, your foot, obviously, because you have, you know, a thumb that sticks out. And chimpanzees have, you know, not only a, a thumb that sticks out, they also have a big toe that sticks out. And you can see that is useful in, like, grasping objects in the tree with your feet. 
Now, Artipithecus ramidus, which is a very early hominin, you can see also had this divergent big toe. Uh, we're missing some of the bones here in the in the midfoot, obviously, but it, it does seem from the facets of the bones here that their first metatarsal was angled quite a bit, indicating, you know, that they also had that grasping big toe. So it appears, I think, that Australopithecus africanus did not have that big toe. Now, the big toe isn't the big toe sticking out being divergent isn't necessarily something that excludes bipedalism because, you know, Artipithecus ramidus um, appears to definitely have been a biped. So, you know, you can be a biped that has a big toe that sticks out. But in this case, it does appear that Australopithecus africanus uh, did have, you know, that big toe in line with all the others. And once again, that's something that's not, I feel like, not like particularly shocking because we knew that for afarensis. Once again, from the AL333 site, scientists have found enough bones of a foot to make a composite foot reconstruction for um, Lucy species. And what we see is, you know, that inline big toe once again, indicating, you know, that all of the Australopithecines probably had feet that were pretty similar to ours. And that all kind of ties into, you know, the discussion of the Laetoli footprints. Um, which creationists often like to bring up as an example, you know, of why, you know, humans must have been around, you know, just as long as the Australopithecines have been around in, in terms of, you know, these certain locations in the fossil record. And as I've mentioned before, you know, I'm very kind of skeptical about assigning footprints to any species. Let me get a drink here a minute. Yeah, so I'm very skeptical about, you know, assigning footprints to species. I think there's a case to be made that the Laetoli footprints came from Australopithecus afarensis, but I don't think it's very certain, especially, you know, when we have, you know, other species of Australopithecines living at the same time. Um, and, you know, humans and Australopithecines, as I've talked about here, have very similar feet. And, I just don't really think there's enough evidence, you know, based on footprints alone to be able to tell the two apart. So I would kind of take issue with the creationists who are using, you know, the Laetoli footprints as evidence that, um, you know, these creatures uh, that, that left them were humans, because I don't, I don't think we can actually prove that at all. Um, yeah. I have a couple more slides here that I'd like to talk about. And this one here is a particularly interesting and controversial subject. Now, anytime that you hear somebody bring things up about the Australopithecines being bipedal, you are inevitably going to hear from the creationists um, about the inner ear. This here is the inner ear. Let me see if I can get this. Yeah, this is a model. It's available on Morphosaurus, as are a lot of other hominin bones. And uh, you can go take a look at them. This isn't a bone. This is basically inside your ear, inside your head. You have a canal inside right in there. And there's three little bones, the incus, the malus, and the stapes, which all work together right around this inner ear and basically, you know, allow you to hear and there's all this kind of intricate drum structure and everything. And basically, the, the, there's some fluid in part of this structure here, which, which basically controls balance. You have these little tiny hairs inside of your ear, and there's some liquid. And basically, depending on how your head is oriented, your hairs can detect you know, where the liquid is, and thus they kind of know whether you're flat or not. And that's like when you go on a swing and get all dizzy and you come off, you're still dizzy for a little while afterwards because that liquid in your ears is still go swinging around really fast and, you know, it makes you dizzy. Now, there is some differences. There are some differences um, between the inner ear canals of various hominids. Chimpanzees have a bit of a different structure and in terms of balance and the balance is particularly important, right? Because if you are a biped, you need to be able to have the balance to stand on your two hind feet because it is less stable 
than being a quadruped where, you know, you've got four different limbs touching the ground and, you know, it, it's just generally easier to stabilize yourself. Now, as I mentioned, creationists like to bring up that the inner ears of the Australopithecines tend to have a lot of similarities with chimpanzees, and that is definitely true. Here uh, from this paper on the inner ear, we, let's see, it says, since obligatory bipedalism makes particular demands on the vestibular apparatus, greater resemblance of STW573 to the vestibular morphology of extinct chimpanzees rather than modern humans could be consistent with a locomotor repertoire combining terrestrial bipedalism and arboreal activities. So when you hear from creationists about the inner ear, they often say, you know, the inner ear is similar to chimpanzees, thus they could not walk upright. But that's not actually the case here. Um, there's, in fact, a bit of kind of a mosaic, in a sense, kind of morphology of the inner ear. As they mention here, um, let's see, where did they mention this? In this paper, they do kind of talk about how there's certain aspects of the inner ear which tend to align better with modern humans, and there's other that tend to kind of align better with chimpanzees and other quadrupedal creatures. The point of that all to be the inner ear of the Australopithecines, including Littlefoot, was not exactly like that of a chimpanzee. There are, are some interesting features which would align it to humans as well. Now, chimpanzees can sometimes walk upright, and the reason they generally don't do so isn't so much because of balance, it's more because uh, it's kind of rather inefficient for them. However, there are some restrictions that this inner ear would have placed upon the Australopithecines. So, for example, the Australopithecines probably would not have been very good at jumping, and some people at least would come to the conclusion that the Australopithecines would not have been good runners either. So it's possible that the shape of the inner ear placed some limitations upon, you know, the agility of the Australopithecines. And from that, it would probably appear that, you know, the Australopithecines weren't doing hurdles and they weren't running track. But the shape of the inner ear does not really necessarily mean that they could not you know, be walking upright, and certainly not, not even against habitual bipedalism. So, you know, bringing up the inner ear, it sounds really good from the first kind of, you know, oh, like, they wouldn't have been able to balance. But, it, you know, really, all that means is that they couldn't jump very well, and they weren't running at super high speeds. So we still have also pithecines who are walking, kind of even jogging around, just probably not doing a lot of jumping. And so basically from all of that, I want to kind of summarize, kind of talk about what we kind of see the Australopithecines as being with all these kind of interesting, uh, you know, morphologies in just one minute after I get to the pelvis. This is the pelvis of uh, SDW573, Littlefoot. And unfortunately, we haven't had like a full paper describing it or the sacrum yet. Sacrum would be the section in the middle here. And unfortunately, we have, you know, some pretty bad photographs of it here. There are, however, a number of reasons, you know, to think that this pelvis actually is that of a biped. Um, if you weren't convinced by the long limb bones, <laughs> um, there's a bit of kind of a bowl-shaped structure here to the pelvis, the rounded kind of edge here. We also have inside of here, the sciatic notch is kind of very short and rounded. Let me grab a modern human here. Here is a modern human pelvis. Sorry for all the rustling sounds there. Um, but this is the pelvis of an anatomically modern human. And what you'll see here, this kind of shape right here, this is called the sciatic notch. And basically, you can see that it has this very nice kind of rounded, narrow shape like this. And it's pretty similar here in an Australopithecine, kind of viewed from an angle like that. And in chimpanzees, it is quite a bit different. They have like very long iliac blades. Uh, uh, sorry, very tall iliums. 
Um, and then in addition, their sciatic notch, rather than kind of being this nice narrow shape, actually comes down like a long ways like this. So um, just kind of from some rather, you know, introductory features like that, we can tell that Littlefoot's pelvis definitely isn't like that of a chimpanzee. It definitely has a lot of features that it's going to share with a human, and it'll be exciting, you know, to see a greater, more in-depth discussion of that once it is described in more detail by the scientists working on it. And I'm sure we will see more on that in the future. So I wanted to kind of bring, wrap up a little conclusions here. I do have some more, so don't go away. Um, but generally, what are the Australopithecines like? There's kind of two views of this. The kind of more, um, shall I say, what's the good word for this? I hate using the term evolutionist. Let's say the conventional model. They would think that these creatures, the Australopithecines, were losing kind of their ability to climb somewhat, and they were dependent primarily upon bipedalism. And so basically, at least some kind of conventional scientists would argue that these features are kind of evolutionary leftovers uh, that are no longer needed and simply haven't been selected out of the population yet. I'm a bit more of a functionalist. I know some in the secular community, uh, kind of the conventional community would be as well. And I think that this is probably evidence that Littlefoot was, you know, climbing a little bit. Uh, there's, I think there's good evidence, not only from the scapula, as I kind of talked about in specific, but also from the, the upper arm, um, various aspects of the rib cage, which... Uh, is also something we need to see published in more detail that, you know, Littlefoot probably was actively climbing. And, you know, doing like cross-sectional cortical studies of the bones, you know, can tell you actually quite a bit about um, how a creature is actually using those bones during its lifetime. And so hopefully we'll see more on that in the future and we can kind of, you know, tell that Littlefoot was actually using his arms or her arms. Why do I think it's a him? It is a her. Her arms to climb. So we have a creature that is not only walking around on its hind feet, but it also also climbing. And it appears that Littlefoot probably wasn't doing a whole lot of perhaps swinging in the trees. Um, possibly some. I, I tend to think not because of, you know, the, the thumb and finger proportions. But whatever the case, it does seem that we have a creature who is you know, moving around in the trees to some extent, and is also walking bipedally along the ground. It's certainly not a knuckle walker, and I think we can pretty confidently say the same for Australopithecus afarensis lucy species as well, that they probably were not knuckle walking simply because of the limb proportions that they had. Now, that we've kind of gone through um, my PowerPoint, I wanted to take a look at some articles and kind of look through them together with you. And specifically, I have a couple scientific papers here. And I also have a paper here by Answers in Genesis. And unfortunately, it is kind of one of the only papers in which they actually attempt to like make any argument about Littlefoot and they don't do very well. But I'm going to share that with you now. Let's see here. There we go. All right, there you go. You can see it. Evolutionists go ape over new fossils. Yeah, this is a very old article from 1999. I looked through their website and I didn't really see a whole lot about, you know, um, Littlefoot at all. They have a picture of Lucy here at the beginning, which at their museum, you know, they have portrayed as being a quadruped. Um, but as we know, you know, from limb proportions, it, it was not walking around on its knuckles. And, you know, it's it probably didn't, its bones probably wouldn't even, you know, fit in a shape like that. But in this article, they kind of basically break down their arguments against this. 
They say preliminary indications are, are that Littlefoot is an Australopithecine, an ape-like creature about four feet tall with a brain one-third the size of modern humans. Um, that is correct. Um, let's see here. They say, actually, analysis of a whole bunch of Australopithecine bones by top-flight anatomists long ago concluded that it was unlikely that they had transitional anatomy. Who is this that they're referring to? Charles Oxnard. Oh, my. I got to do a whole stream about like talking about like the history of like Charles Oxnard and um, the other man. Let's see. Who is that again? Can't think of his name, but there's like two guys who creationists are always quoting about this um, who back in the, you know, 1970s or 60s, it was they were kind of arguing against Australopithecines being quadrupedal and basically nobody believes them anymore, but creationists still like to quote them. Uh, so it'd be interesting to do a whole video about that sometime. But basically they use that to discredit this skeleton, even though, you know, this was done, you know, before Littlefoot, you know, was ever actually described or published. So this doesn't really apply very much to Littlefoot. Um, they say, we agree with those experts who, despite being evolutionists, insist that the Australopithecines were not in the human line, but were a unique group which spent most of their time in the trees. If anything, they were somewhat like today's pygmy chimps. Um, I mean, like, in what way exactly were they like pygmy chimpanzees? Because they weren't like pygmy chimpanzees in terms of their foot anatomy. They had different hand proportions than chimpanzees. They had different limb proportions than chimpanzees. Their pelvis is completely different. I mean, like, there's just really not a whole lot of similarity to pygmy chimpanzees there. Uh, sorry to say. Um, they do mention the inner ear here. They say the fact that they did not walk upright in the human manner was further clinched by Dr. Fred Spoor's team using CAT scans on the skull to study the organ of balance. Now, if I'm correct, let, let me see this. Uh, number three. Um, let's see. Where was that? Uh, I lost that. Um, Fred Spoor. Okay, yeah. Uh, they did those CT scans and basically, oh, so yeah. Okay, so they mentioned here, there is no reason to expect any different result if similar scans are permitted on Littlefoot. So they actually published this before they actually had the scans of Littlefoot come out. And you'll see here though, they, they predict, you know, that the scans of Littlefoot will be similar to those from Afarensis and they were indeed and basically, they argue that also pythocines show the the scan show that also pythocines were walking like apes. Uh, you know, I think they mean like chimpanzees rather than humans, as we've already talked about. The inner ear bones don't necessitate that. They say Littlefoot may be relatively complete, which is important for creationists, and that it will be much harder for evolutionary inventiveness to fill in the missing bias. And this is something that I really take issue with because what happens eventually is whenever we find a fossil that, you know, creationists don't like, it eventually, you know, just comes up to creationists saying, you know, this is evolutionary inventiveness because it's too fragmentary. And in this case, you know, we have something that is so complete, it, it hardly requires any imagination as they recognize here. And, you know, I, I think creationists sometimes have a hard time, you know, seeing that what we're actually looking at in terms of like Lucy, when we're reconstructing her is not inventiveness. We're, we're looking at details of the bone and hypothesizing based on those, you know, how she lived. And, um, you know, it, it's not just imagination. It is based on measurements and, and studies. Hey, Brian Stevens, we have uh, him in the chat. He says, I've been having a debate on one of the videos trying to understand what reason there is to believe that the Garden of Eden is a historical and not fictional place. No one will explain this. To me, it seems like the Garden of Eden is a work of fiction, just like other mythological locations. Um, well, I would say that it is not a mythological place. Obviously, I am a young earth creationist. I think that there has been a lot of, you know, confirmation for biblical, um, places in terms of, you know, archaeology. Archaeology within the Holy Land has, you know, revealed a lot of things which have confirmed the biblical view about, you know, the placement of certain cities. Um, it's also, you know, shown kind of, for example, that people were in 
kind of debate about whether or not, you know, King David ever actually existed. And then they found a, uh, a seal that had his name on it. So I think, you know, biblical archaeology is actually a great field and has shown that quite a bit of, you know, what the Bible talks about is actually, you know, substantiated by the archaeological record. Now, as to whether or not we could ever actually find a site for Eden, I would actually take a bit of a different view from a lot of younger creationists who would say, you know, Eden is in the Middle East. And that's because um, I would take more of a position, you know, that during the flood, some plates of the earth may have even been subducted down into the mantle. And so I think it's possible, you know, that the Garden of Eden, where it once was, could even be, you know, inside of the mantle of the earth right now. Um, a lot of creationists would argue, you know, um, there's the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Um, you know, I'm not really sure what to exactly say about that. I, I am not at all certain that the Garden of Eden is in the Middle East, however. Uh, thank you for that, Brian Stevens. Anybody else who is watching and has any questions, please also drop them in the chat or any comments you have to make. And if there are none of those, I will go on to looking at kind of some papers about Littlefoot here. Particularly, um, let's see, I want to check out this one about, let's see here. Um, there's several interesting ones here to check out. This is, is this the paper about the inner ear? Ah, yes. Okay. So this is a one about the functional anatomy. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, yes, Brian Stevens. I, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's controversial. Um, you know, even among younger creationists in particular to the, the location of the garden of Eden and, you know, obviously in Christians broader, you know, whether such a place even exists, I, I think, yeah, I think it's certainly important to have, you know, differing views, but uh, respect for one another. Um, so here we are. Uh, let's see, you can see that now. It's called Functional Anatomy, Biomechanical Performance Capabilities and Potential Niche of SCW 573 by Crompton at all 2018. So this is basically a a paper where they're kind of looking at the skeleton of this creature and kind of trying to interpret, you know, how it was moving around and everything. I haven't actually taken a whole much of a look at this before, so uh, you are all joining me along kind of for the first time. They kind of have a discussion of the skeleton and the discovery here. And let's see, here they kind of discuss this. This is interesting. They say, Figure two shows that the ilia of STW431, which is another famous Australopithecus Africanus pelvis, along with 573, so that's Littlefoot, are closely similar in size and shape. The greater sciatic notch indicates that STW573 is most likely a female. Okay, so that's that's interesting. Um, let me show you back to my PowerPoint here, because yeah, that is one thing uh, which is used to determine, you know, sex in a fossil, you know, looking at the pelvis, because the pelvis obviously plays a very important role in birthing, and thus it is unique um, among, you know, humans. Okay. Um, okay. Let me see. I'm having some issues here. Uh, let me X out of that. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go back to the PowerPoint. Um, but basically what we're talking about here when we look at the pelvis is this, this notch here is called the sciatic notch. This is probably from a male uh, because it has a pretty narrow sciatic notch. For females, it is a little bit wider. Um, and I talked about how this is something that differs between chimpanzees and humans. And yeah, it varies to an even greater degree in, in them. So chimpanzees, Males and females would also have, you know, wider and lesser notches, but, you know, chimpanzees in general have much longer ones than either male or female humans. But from, you know, the shape of this, we can tell that the, you know, pelvic inlet in the floor of the pelvis uh, was wider and thus, you know, would have allowed for easier birthing and thus probably comes from a female. Um, going on through this paper, um, this is, this is interesting. They say cranial and dental anatomy and diet. 
and they talk a little bit about the cranium and how they are attempting to separate the mandible from the cranium so that they can kind of do some more studies of the teeth. Um, they mention kind of some things about afarensis and anamensis and what they were dieting. And then they say um, here, as noted above, morphometric and general anatomical descriptions of the long bones are provided by Heaton of the scapula and... Um, and then they say detailed descriptions and morphometrics should be sought therein. And they say they're going to focus, you know, more on kind of the significance of some of these comparisons. They say the ribs and vertebral column are currently under study by our team, but it appears that the thoracic inlet is narrow, unlike the pinna contemporaneous KSDVP 1 slash 1. So that is an Australopithecus afarensis skeleton. And what they're talking about here is the vertebral column. Um, way up uh, kind of right in this region of your body there are vertebrae that are called thoracic and they're talking about kind of this hole in the middle of them which allows the spinal column to come through and they mentioned you know that that is narrower they say the clavicles are broadly human-like in form and indeed remarkably long very similar to those in the much taller uh you know homo erectus i would say individual that's kind of interesting, uh, the, the very long clavicle. That is something to do, you know, with exactly how your uh, scapula is oriented. Because if you have a scapula that is like, you know, a chimpanzee, it's going to stick out a little further unless you have to have a little bit longer of a clavicle as well. Um, basically, this is an interesting paper you want to check out, perhaps. I have uh, most of the links that I kind of discussed in the description of the video if you want to check those out. Let's see, I was, let, let's skip down kind of through this to uh, kind of the uh, conclusions here. I definitely am interested in this, but I know you probably all don't want to exactly hear all of the little anatomical details about the bones. They say, we predict the STW-573's potential niche was exploitation of both arboreal and terrestrial resources facilitated by plasticity and degeneracy. Tooth wear and postcranial similarities to A. animensis, that's another Australopithecus species, suggest a, similarly, a similar primarily C3 diet in mesic mixed forest slash grassland. This might include fibrous tubers on the ground and at water margins, as well as tough-skinned arboreal fruit. So that provides, you know, some of the context for exactly what this individual may have been eating and perhaps why he was or she was climbing in the trees to, to you know, uh, exploit uh, fruit, a very good resource. Um, they say STW-573 was an effective arboreal biped and climber, which had, however, sacrificed some arboreal effectiveness in favor of enhanced and energetic efficiency in walking medium to long distances on the ground. She would not have been as effective when load carrying, unlike Homo ergaster. Her locomotor posture was upright bipedalism, whether on the ground or on branches, and she was able to stand upright without muscular activity because without much, uh, because of a locking or screw home mechanism in the knee, which does not seem to have been present in Ramidus or Anamensis and Afarensis. Um, they say that they're working on some uh, work on gorillas to kind of establish some things about that. Um, but there's kind of a little bit of context, you know, for uh, what we think, um, you know, STW-573 was acting like. It was probably, you know, moving around in these trees to exploit resources like fruit, but then also coming down onto the ground to walk around a bit. And here is where I kind of wanted to discuss a little bit the difference between, you um, bipedalism and quadrupedalism because a lot of the times when I talk about things like this I eventually have you know creation is saying well you know even chimpanzees can walk upright on the ground and even gorillas can walk upright on the ground sometimes so how do you know that this creature you know wasn't just living in the trees and then once in a while you know take a couple steps on the ground to get to the next tree well that's kind of where the difference between um you know habitual bipedalism and then temporary bipedalism comes in because yeah obviously all sorts of creatures can be bipedal uh from time to time like you know dogs um 
my little poochie right next to me here. Um, she can dance on her hind legs and chimpanzees can walk on their hind legs, but that does not make them bipeds because to be a biped, you have to do so habitually. Littlefoot has all of these hallmarks of a habitual biped, as we talked about the limb proportions. And there's a lot of details I didn't get into, such as, you know, the angle of the femoral, the femoral kind of shaft and things like that. And basically the point being, there is a distinction between habitual bipedalism and temporary, you know, bipedal activity. And from all available evidence, it does seem that the Australopithecines were habitual bipeds, you know, unlike chimpanzees. And so that is kind of some of the reasoning behind why exactly we make a distinction between, you know, those two forms of walking upright on your hind legs and why one is, you know, considered actually to indicate something about how a creature was moving around most of the time. And the other simply indicates, you know, you know, temporary activity. Um, I've been rambling on quite a bit here. Uh, that's it for probably most of the stuff I wanted to talk about. So I'll probably be shutting down things here unless we have any questions or comments in the chat. So if you have any thoughts about anything I just said, please write them down and send them to me. And it looks like um, that will be all to, for today. So thank you all so much for joining me. I really enjoyed this. This was my first live stream. Um, it went better than I was expecting. I'm not a particularly techy person. Um, so that is kind of surprising that I was able to get things to work out. And so I want to thank you all for joining me today. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. If you have not already done so, I'd ask you to please subscribe to the channel. I do have a lot of great content and also some interviews coming up soon, which you will not want to miss. And so I would appreciate that very much. So all of you have a wonderful rest of your day. And thanks for listening to me talk a little bit about the little foot.